So last time we finished off with this idea that if you have any differential equation that has constant coefficients and it's equal to zero, then it has a solution in the form e to the exponent alpha x um, and alpha must be determined and you know if you have a second order differential you'll have two solutions if you have a third order differential you have three solutions and so on but the important thing is is that if f of x has two or more solutions then any linear combination of these solutions is also a solution to the parent equation so remember our parent equation was a differential equation in this form so any differential equation in this form has a solution in the form of y is equal to e to the exponent alpha x. But the most important point to remember here is that this isn't the most general solution. The most general solution is actually a linear combination of all of the solutions y of x has. So here, if this is a second order differential, you'll get two solutions, and the most general solution will be a linear combination of both of the solutions, okay? So the C1 and C2, um, they're actually integration constants, and we're getting a little technical here. How I derived this equation was by telling you that, okay, e to the exponent alpha x is a solution. But if you take you know, higher level math and you're used to multivariable calculus and you can do, um, you can solve this equation without breaking it up or knowing the solution, then you'll actually um, derive this most general solution as an answer and C1 and C2 will be your integration constants. But we're not focused um, more on the math part of it. We are just focused on getting to the answer and trying to see uh, what the solution is to the classical wave equation. This isn't a really a math class. So just understand that these equations have solutions in the form of y is equal to e to the exponent alpha x, but all of those solutions, any linear combination of those solutions is also a solution to y of x, um, and more importantly, it's a general solution to um, y of x. So rather than using the individual solutions, when we'll be working with these type of problems, we'll actually be using the linear combination version of this. So moving on, um, last time we discussed that if k was equal to zero, then it turned out that we didn't really get anything useful. Um, we ended up with something called a trivial solution or an insignificant solution. It was a solution that was mathematically valid, but physically it made no sense. So now we're going to go on to case number two and we're going to assume that k is actually a positive number. So k is a positive number, that's something that I say in English, but if I want to represent this mathematically, then I can represent this um, as this equation over here. So I can rewrite capital K as just small k squared. So remember, any number squared is a positive number, so math in the language of math, um, I can write a positive number as just a square term. Okay, so I'm going to tackle x of x first, and we'll do t of t later. So um, I know that, okay, k, capital K, is equal to k squared. So I go ahead and I substitute that in place of this k. I'm going to use a different color pen to make this more obvious. Okay, so if I substitute k squared in place of k, I'm left with this form of the equation. Now, you ask yourself two questions. Does this have constant coefficients? And the answer is, yes, it does. Um, and the other question you ask yourself is, is this equal to zero? And that answer is also yes. So any equation that has these two criteria met, then it has a solution in the form of e to the exponent alpha x where alpha must be determined. So once I know alpha, then I know all of the solutions, and then the most general solution will be a linear combination of those solutions. So, moving on. I'm going to replace x of x with its solution, which is e to the exponent alpha x. Um, these three dots that I put over here, they just mean therefore. So it's a shorthand notation. I'll use it a lot. Um, so just get used to it. I go ahead and I substitute um, x of x with its solution. Um, and I go on and I have to take two derivatives. I have to, I have to, um, this is a second order 
derivative, so I have to take two derivatives of e to the exponent of x. Here I don't really need to do anything else. So if I take the first derivative, I'm left with alpha outside, um, and then I take the derivative again, and then I get alpha squared e to the exponent of x minus k squared e to the exponent of x. If I go ahead and divide both sides by e to the exponent of x, I'm left with alpha squared minus k squared is equal to zero. So therefore, alpha squared is equal to k squared, or alpha is equal to positive negative k. Now, because alpha has two values, that signals that there's two solutions to this equation. Okay, so the first solution is going to be e to the exponent kx, and the second solution is going to be e to the exponent negative kx. But remember, the most general solution um, is a linear combination of both of these. So it's going to be c1 e to the exponent kx plus c2 e to the exponent negative kx. So this is the most general solution because it incorporates both of the solutions. So I don't have to look at the solutions individually, um, I actually just put it into one equation and it makes life easier. So we'll be working with this form of the equation, okay? So the more pressing question, is this our answer? Um, well, let's see. We have to apply our boundary condition and we got to find out what the value of C1 and C2 is. So our, at our boundaries, x is equal to 0 and x is equal to L, um, those, that's that physical system of a string that we had, we know that the x component of u is equal to 0 at both of the boundaries. So I'm going to use this information and I'm going to plug it back into this general equation that I have and I'm going to try to figure out what c1 and c2 is. So first I put x is equal to 0, I look at, the, I look at one extreme end of our system. Um, and if I do that, I replace x with 0, um, and well, this is going to become 1, because anything to the exponent 0 is just 1. Similarly, this will become 1, and I'm left with c1 is equal to c2, or c1 is equal to negative c2. Okay, now I go on and look at the second boundary condition, and that's when I'm looking at the other extreme end of the system, when x is equal to L, the x component of u is also equal to 0 at that boundary as well. So I go ahead and replace x with L, so that's where these L's come from, and I say this is equal to 0. I know what c1 is. c1 is just negative c2. So they're both the same numbers, but one of them has the opposite sign. So I go ahead and I replace it. Um, I can factor out the C2. I can factor out the C2 because it's common in both of the terms. And if I do that, I'm left with negative EKL plus E to the exponent negative KL is equal to 0. So that means one of these terms has to equal to 0. Well. C2 can equal to 0. There's nothing preventing C2 from equal, equaling to 0. So actually, C2 is equal to 0. But more importantly, why isn't e to the exponent kl plus e to the exponent negative kl equal to 0? Well, the answer is this. They will equal to 0, but not in the interval that we're looking for. Um, if I want this guy to be 0, then L has to approach negative infinity. That means um, L has to be a really, really tiny negative number, okay? And that would make the first term equal to 0. If I want the second term to equal to 0, then L has to be a really, really big number because e to the exponent negative, let's say, 100 billion, it's going to give me an answer that's like 0 0.0000000001, which is almost equal to 0. But that's that's not a part of our boundary. L is a constant. L can't be negative infinity or positive infinity. L is just a number like 5 meters, 4 meters. It's just how far off the rope is at the other extreme end. So obviously this E term can't be 0. That leaves us with the fact that C2 is equal to 0. If C2 is equal to 0, then based on this equation, I know that C1 is also equal to 0. If C1 and C2 are equal to 0, then that means x of x is also equal to 0 for all values of x, and that doesn't really mean 
anything either. It's mathematically okay. The math works out. There's nothing wrong with our math, but physically it's not okay. So this again is our trivial solution. Trivial, the word trivial in English means insignificant, meaning eh, it's okay mathematically, but physically it's insignificant for us. We don't care much about it. So, K is not a positive number that leaves us with the fact that case, case 2 is also wrong. Case 2 is not the right answer as well. So you better believe that K is actually going to be a negative number. So we'll work out the math in the next video. Um, I hope this helped.